In 1077, plans were being drawn up and construction started on a new Norman trademark in sunny green St Albans, Hertfordshire. Building materials were taken and reused from the local Roman site of Verulanium and Anglo-Saxon peasants were conscripted in considerable numbers to the workforce. But this time, it wasn't a castle. The Normans may have been brutal fighters, but they were also extremely religious. Alongside William's impressive castle building campaigns, within 50 years of the invasion, almost every Anglo-Saxon church, cathedral and abbey in England had been demolished and rebuilt in Norman style. In Normandy, these were built to display their Christianity, but in England, they were also built to proclaim their wealth and power over the local population. And there is no better place to see this than in St Albans, where work started on a new Norman cathedral in 1077. By the mid 11th century, the Normans were at the cutting edge of architecture. So they developed a distinctive Norman Romanesque style, which had these consistent series of features. It had these round arches. It had often a kind of three story elevation of these arches. Um, it also had in their churches, a nave with aisles divided by columns. And this was really fashionable new stuff. These cutting edge and fashionable architectural features can be distinctively seen in St Albans, where the columns and arches display the new Norman style. And in St Albans Cathedral, there is a national treasure of the Norman period. As you walk through the entrance, you are drawn to the wall paintings on these white columns. Today, only the base colours remain but these would have been painted vibrant blues and reds. This one up here is the oldest in the cathedral because it is the only one where Jesus is not crossing his feet while being crucified. In all of the other ones, he is. This became custom after around 1300. When people think of the Normans, they think of 1066. They think of the Battle of Hastings. They think of the harrying of the North. But this isn't really the Norman legacy. These are major events to be sure, but what lasted is Norman architecture, Romanesque architecture. Now, of course, we don't see as much of this now, a thousand years later, as we might like, but what we do have is some of the most monumental feats of architecture in the entire kingdom. I'm thinking of, for example, the Tower of London. I'm thinking of Winchester Cathedral. That's the longest cathedral in all of Europe. Now, these buildings have stood the test of time in part because of their beauty, but also because they appear to embody a period of history which people naturally find fascinating. Alongside these changes in architecture, William embarked on a church reform and restructuring programme. This was known as the Normanisation of the church. The Normanisation of the church refers to the changes that happened to the English church, which made it more like the Norman church after 1066. That included changes in worship and liturgy, but also changes of personnel. Over time, gradually, we switched from an Anglo-Saxon episcopate, so English bishops, to bishops who were all drawn from the continent or Normandy. The church hierarchy is normanized because um, for much the same reasons that William spends a lot of time uh, normanizing the earldoms and you know his secular rulers, he doesn't necessarily trust a lot of the um, English bishops, a lot of the English abbots, because we should remember that bishops and abbots come largely from the upper class. They are politically involved. They have brothers, sisters, um, fathers, mothers in the political world who are not church people. But the one person William did trust was his newly appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, 
In 1070, William appointed a loyal follower called Lamb Frank, who began helping William Normanize the church. And it was Lamb Frank's nephew, Paul of Caen, who became the first Norman abbot of St Albans Cathedral. Much of the current layout here that exists today was completed under Paul of Caen, demolishing the Saxon buildings and constructing the longest nave in the country, which was modelled on Lanfranc's Cathedral in Canterbury. And the link between Paul and Lanfranc was very important for St Albans because it meant that Archbishop Lanfranc, the most important churchman in the country, gave St Albans his support and he encouraged other people to invest in St Albans. But of course, Paul of Caen could not complete this on his own. He employed the best architect in the realm, Robert the Mason. Robert, a Norman, set about a monumental task of building this new, imposing religious site. Just like the Saxons had been doing, Robert reused materials from the local Roman site of Verulanium. Up there, you can see the Saxon columns, Roman brickwork and Norman quarried stone. But what's more impressive is how one particular feature of Robert's work remains here today, the Norman bell tower. From outside the cathedral, the bell tower's Norman look can still be seen and its bells can be heard which ring out across the city. At these crossroads of the cathedral is the only 11th century crossing tower still standing in England. Robert began with foundations that went down to hit bedrock, then special thick supporting walls and four massive brick piers were built. From here he worked his way up to construct this tower, standing at a magnificent 144 feet. But it wasn't just the soaring Norman architecture that was reformed. This change was accompanied by a purge of Anglo-Saxon church leaders where the Pope sent his representatives or legates to England to ensure it was the Normans who were controlling the church. And after this purge in 1070, what we have left from the old regime are four bishops that are appointed by Edward the Confessor who aren't Anglo-Saxon, they're not English, they're from Lotharingia. And then we have two Anglo-Saxon English bishops left. And among those is the great survivor, Wolfstan of Worcester, who remains in post until 1095. This did not mean that everyone who worked for the church was a Norman. Most parish priests were Anglo-Saxons, but the church hierarchy itself was quickly Normanized. For example, new Norman bishops and abbots influenced the messages people received about their king, their new lords, and how God favoured the Normans. Archbishop Lamb Frank was heavily involved in these religious reforms, to separate the church from everyday aims of making money, gaining power and getting involved in sexual relationships. Lamb Frank wanted church workers to lead spiritual lives of prayer and serving God and he believed that the previous Anglo-Saxon ones were not spiritual men whatsoever. So what Lamb Frank tried to do was to make the English church conform to continental practices. He did this through various means. One of the most important was holding regular councils. So he does this from 1072 onwards. And what he does at these councils is he gathers churchmen together and he tries to enforce reform. So he prohibits simony, which is the buying and selling of ecclesiastical offices. And he tries to promote clerical celibacy, which is where um, clergy churchmen don't have sexual relations with anyone. He also introduced special courts to trial those who worked under the church, giving it an important role in the Norman legal system. So one of the new things that the Normans brought to the English church was the office of the Archdeacon and Archdeacon's courts. Now an Archdeacon was the judicial officer of the bishop. He was there to enforce um, clerical discipline, so church discipline. And what he did was he would convene local clergy and he would go there and enforce reform. Now this was really important because this created that link between the centre, which was promoting reform, and the locality where they wanted reform to happen. 
With these church reforms and the rebuilding of many religious sites, William further strengthened his control on England. He yet again stamped a monumental style over his newly conquered territory. The cathedral at St Albans is just one of the many magnificent sites that still exist today. Exeter, Ely, Durham, Winchester and Gloucester also show how the Normans built cathedrals to last. These striking new religious sites alongside the monumental stone castles were permanent reminders that England was under new management. William had strengthened his kingdom and changed England forever.